Happy Easter. Anybody make an Easter basket for somebody this year? Anybody receive an Easter basket? Anybody eat any chocolate? Whoa. Anybody eat any of that little sugar that's known as peeps? <laughs> Anybody color any eggs? Few colored eggs. Anybody hide any eggs? Planning to hide any eggs? Anybody having dinner with relatives? Anybody avoiding relatives? <laughs> Happy Easter. You are in good company. I love this time of year. I love this tradition. A, a lot of ministers have an inside term called creasters. It means that, that we know that there's individuals that only come out at Christmas and Easter. And <laughs> because it's, we know that there's something bigger than life and we don't want to miss that. And so we welcome each and every one of you here today. Every Easter, I'm reminded of a family circus cartoon that to me is just so precious. It's just two captions. In the first caption, it starts out with their two young children. They've clearly just gotten up in the morning, and they each have discovered their Easter basket. It's a little boy and his little sister, and, and so the little boy says, who colored all these eggs? And the sister says, the Easter bunny. And then he digs in there and finds some jelly beans, and he said, well, who gave us these jelly beans? And the sister said, the Easter bunny. And then he takes out this big chocolate Easter bunny that's all his own. And he said, but who gave us this chocolate Easter bunny? And his sister says, the Easter bunny. And so the next caption, now they're all dressed up in their Easter outfits. They're in church. And the minister is standing up front. And the minister says, and they came to the tomb and they saw the stone had been rolled away. Who could have done such a thing? <laughs> And the little boy jumped up and said, the Easter Bunny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that story because it reminds us that a lot of Easter is a story. There's a lot of uh, Easter bunnies and rabbits and eggs and, and Christian stories and, and Jewish stories and things get, that get put in together. But the reason that we talk about these things so many years later, is because an impact was made. Something, you know, whatever we believe, and in unity we look at the Bible and the Scripture, we look at all sacred text as informing us along our spiritual journey. Not necessarily literal, but placed in a historical context, and we seek the der to derive the metaphysical, meaning beyond the physical, beyond the literal, the deeper meaning. And so we're going to look at some of that today, but I do want to begin by just sharing um, just succinctly what is the traditional Easter story. Well, you know, it begins on Palm Sunday. Last Sunday, Reverend Megan beautifully spoke about Palm Sunday, where it's the time of the Jewish Passover, and you've got a procession of the Roman Empire coming in to, to, to make sure that nothing goes uh, sideways. And then we read about Jesus having a counter procession on a young donkey, making his way in, clearly bringing about a different message. The crowds are waving palm branches. Why palm branches? If you look at their coins, the palm was their national symbol. It would have been the equivalent of us raising our American flag. They were yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, which if you look at what that meant in that time, it meant save us, save us. So it's a very different understanding of what a lot of people may believe, but it's where people were saying, we're the oppressed people again. We want to be the nation that's in charge, and you are demonstrating something that's mighty and powerful, and you're gathering these followers. So save us, restore us to our rightful place as God's chosen people. Restore our kingdom is what they were asking for. And yet what happened is the Savior they were wanting was not what Jesus was about. He was about a different message. And he spoke truth to power. He went to the gates and he spoke to the, the political religious empire in place at the time. 
And as is recorded in Matthew 21, 43, he looked up. He looked up and he spoke to those who were in power and he said, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a people who will bring forth its fruits. He went on to observe the Passover meal with his disciples, which today has become known as the Last Supper. He then went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And we know that there in the final hours he was betrayed, he was arrested, he was subsequently tried, and he was subsequently crucified by the Roman authorities. Now the scriptures, all three synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, all three of them say this it, that happened. Then Jesus died at the very moment of his crucifixion. And at the very moment of Jesus' death, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. The veil in the temple was completely split in two. And that's very important, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We'll come back. And so he dies, his body is placed in a tomb, and on the third day, Easter. Easter Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other women come to discover that the stone has been rolled away and the body is not there as the story goes. Also, according to scripture, it says that Jesus appeared several times to his followers and his disciples quite often. At first, they didn't recognize him, but then they would finally recognize him. And he was there bringing instructions and affirmations of faith to them. That's the essence of what you will hear as the, the Christian story of Easter. Well, if Jesus died for anything, he died for the truth that he stood for. And as the writers of the scriptures do say, at that time, something new was ushered in, a new covenant as it's often called. Josh, uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong wrote this as being Jesus' voice. Jesus saying to the disciples, you must not be dependent on me. You must rise to a new level of responsibility and maturity. It is expedient that I go away. It is to your advantage that I go away. God cannot be limited to one mediator. All of you are lives in whom and through whom God can work. I was the doorway into this new experience, but once you've walked through the door, there's a limitless spirit that you can engage. The spirit will open new doors and lead you into all truth. Trust what you know, trust who you are, and live into your new being, Christ in you. The Hinduist tradition would call it the Atman in you. The Buddha would say the Buddha spark. It's that perfect per spark of divinity in you, your hope, your glory. And then later, as was recorded in Romans 8, verse 11, if the spirit of the one that dwells in Jesus also dwells in you, you too shall be lifted up. That's a beautiful story. It's our story. It's a reoccurring story. And so we take just a minute to go back and to look at what is this veil that they're talking about in the temple? Well, you may remember that during the lifetime of Jesus, the temple in Jerusalem was the center of religious life. The reason to this very day that Holy Land is being fought over is because for many, many, many centuries, people have believed that that's where the presence of God dwelt. And if you wanted God to be in God's favor, if you wanted to be in relationship with God, then you needed to be in very close proximity. And so at that time, that's just the way it was. The temple was where the presence of God was. But no one could actually see or get next to the presence of God, and so they had what was called a veil between the Holy of Holies. You can read about it. It describes it as being about four inches thick fabric with, with ornate um, carvings on it. And so that veil was where the line and God was behind it. And the interesting thing is no human being other than one person one time a year could go back behind the veil. It was called the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest could go behind the veil, and that's when they would make the sacrifices and they would make atonement for the people and take the blessings of God back to the people. So, when Jesus died, and all three scriptures say, that veil was split in two. 
completely torn apart. That is the message of Easter. That is the most revolutionary thing. Now, you look at the Gospels and you say, but why doesn't it go into more and tell us exactly what that meant? Well, the, the, the meaning was inherent. For example, if you've ever tried to go to a place and there was a big sign that said, do not enter, and it had a gate, and then all of a sudden, one day, somebody said, hey, that, that's gone now. There's no more do not enter sign, and there's no more gate. No one would have to explain that to you. You would know, once upon a time, I could not enter. Now I can go in. And so the veil being split in two was, was radical. It turned everything upside down on its head. It basically said the Spirit of God is no longer back there behind the veil. The Spirit of God is, is, has been released and is out there and it's around for everybody to see. The other thing that was so powerful about that is when people went to the temple to worship and, and if, the, if this is where the veil of the, is and only one person go behind, there's a hierarchy of who has a right to be close to God, how close you can get. The outer rings were the Gentiles. They had the spectator seats way back there. Right inside of that were the women, the Jewish women. Next row was the common Jewish man. Next row was the servant for the temple. Next were the priest in training. Next were the readers of the scroll. Next were the priest, and then the high priest, and then the one holy priest. Now, you have to realize that when that veil came apart, not only did that, in theory, put the Spirit of God out for everybody to have access to it, but it also meant the people no longer had to line up and be in any kind of hierarchical order of who gets how close to God. Do you see what came down that day? What came down that day was that Anything that hinders us from standing boldly and consciously and confidently in the presence of God has been removed. And anything that would hinder us from believing that every person has equal access to the same spirit has been removed. That's a powerful thing when we really begin to understand that. And so today we want to take a few minutes to consider this, that that's the metaphysical teaching of Easter is that whatever has hindered us from consciously standing in the presence of God and as part of the presence of God has been removed. Anything that's hindered us has been removed. So let's break that down into so what's. Okay, so what? Well, if you go with that story and you go with the so what, the first question becomes, well, so what? Is your God out of the box? Or is your God still tucked away a little bit and not freely moving out and about planet Earth and everywhere? That which you call God, the Creator, is your God fully and completely out of any box, out of any confines. You know, the, the Hebrews would not even utter the word for God. They had a, uh, what's it called, a tetragrammatization. Somebody correct me. Chris would know over here. When they, a Latin teacher. When you, they couldn't even say the name of the God because the minute you name a thing, you define it, and you also say what it is not. If it's this, it's not that. So they couldn't even name it because they knew that it was out of any box. And I look at our world today and I think how backwards we have gone in some ways, in some areas, when some people claim to have the only box on God. Amen? That this is the way, the only way, this is our God, we know who our God is, we got it packaged up like this, and if you don't believe in this one, then, then you're our enemy and God's enemy and going to hell. And so this message was to to break down those walls and to take God out of the box. Back in, uh, before the fall of the Roman Empire, there's a famous bishop known as St. Augustine of Hippo. As the story goes, and as a true story, he was writing a book. He was a great writer, great theologian. 
And he was trying to understand at the time what he understood as the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And he was grappling with how could God be three different entities? And he, he said that he was just so wrapped up in his head that he thought, I've got to just stop. And so he left his dark little room and went out and started walking down the beach. And he said, as I strolled the shoreline, I looked up in the sky and I said, God, help me understand you. And as he looked back down way in the distance ahead on the beach, he saw a young child, a little figure, running to the water and scooping up something and running back. He's got closer and closer and closer. This little child, which turned out to be a little boy, was running back and forth, getting something out of the ocean and take it to the shore, something back and forth. When he got there and re approached the little boy, he said, son, what are you doing? He said, well, sir, I've dug a hole in the sand, and I'm trying to fill it with all the water in the ocean. <laughs> Augustine chuckled, too. Augustine chuckled and said, well, son, that's actually impossible. You can't possibly fit the vast ocean in that tiny little hole. And Augustine said, I kid you not, that little boy looked up at me and said, well, sir, neither can you fit the vastness of God in your tiny little mind. And, <laughs> and turned and walked away like, thank you, God. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Is our God out of the box? Is our God big enough? We, you know, sometimes in new thought, we, we embrace the concept that all that we are is God. And there can be the tendency then to reduce God to only all that we are. Amen? It can happen. But see, remember that God's that which we call God, the G-O-D, the grand overall design, it transcends our understanding and our perceptions. How many of you has your understanding of that which we call God, has it changed at least once in your life? Has it changed dramatically in your life? Are you comfortable saying, I still roll around in the I don't know? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Remaining open to a God that is greater than self does not diminish God. It doesn't diminish the self. On the contrary, it's about recognizing that we are a part. I, uh, the, the most recent analogy, we use an analogy quite often about like a drop of the ocean. It's not the whole ocean, but all that it is is the ocean. The most recent analogy that came to me is a sun ray. One day I was out walking my dog, and it was just one of these glorious days with these Carolina blue sky and that sunshine, and you could see the rays coming through. And I thought, that's what I am. I'm a ray. Uh, there's the sun, there's the source, there's all that is. And each and every one of us are rays of that. All that you are is an expression of it. And yet, to me, it's very comforting to know that there's more than my tiny little mind can think of sometimes, that I can. The beautiful thing about opening, when we open our hearts and our minds to the greatness of God, it does not diminish us. It places us in pure majesty. It places us in the field of infinite potential. It places us to be those rays that can channel and bring forth light as we begin to understand our relationship with the source. It opens us to be a conduit for that universal flow of love and energy. It also fosters a healthy sense of humility in us. And it also fosters a very powerful sense of transformation and possibility. That there's, I don't want to put God in a box. And I don't want to put myself in a box. And I don't want to put any of you in a box. The Easter story is asking and saying, whatever has hindered us for consciously standing in the presence and as the presence, it's been removed. And so we have the ability and the responsibility to do our work to take God out of any boxes that we may be placing God in. So the first question is, is your God out of the box? Is your God big enough? The second one 
Is your God actively present wherever you are? An active presence wherever you are. One of my favorite stories, true story, of a woman um, who had a beautiful home, loved to garden, and a new gentleman moved into the neighborhood. Every morning, he would get up about daybreak and go out and walk his dog. And when he passed that particular piece of property, he would just always stop and take in the beautiful flowers. And he did that every morning, routinely. And one morning, the woman was out working quite early, working in the garden. And so he said, is this your home? And she said, it is. And he said, wow, I, I admire these beautiful gardens every morning when I walk. And he said, it, it's just, I'm just so impressed that the, the beautiful garden that God is growing. And she said, that's true. And you should have seen it when God was the only one taking care of it. <laughs> that, that Eric Butterworth says, God can do no more for you than God can do through you. You know, making our God big enough to inspire us, to inform us, to motivate us, to uplift us. So that we are then working, we're moving out that that. To, when we find ourselves thinking we're stuck, to know that there's an activity, an active presence in life that can move us along. This year at Unity of the Blue Ridge is a year of influence. And every month we have been offering a challenge or an initiative, something you can do to just help you really live in an empowered way of, of growing yourself, deepening your spiritual principles, and being the influence that you can be. So tomorrow is April 1st, and we have for you a new challenge. Some of you may have heard of it before. It's a 21-day no-complaint challenge. Anybody heard of that? And so as you head out, you're going to see a basket with there's different colored little, little bracelets that you can wear, and there's some that are much wider and much more funky, if that's your style. But you wear the bracelet, or you can put it in your pocket, and so what happens is you notice, you make a day, a commitment for 21 days, I'm not going to complain. Now, that doesn't mean you're hiding your feelings, avoiding your feelings. Let's talk about what that does mean. So you're going to be on Facebook or in line or at maybe at that Easter dinner with family or somebody you didn't think is going to be there, and you're going to catch yourself like, you know the energy of complaining. There's not a lot of good that comes out of that. And have you ever noticed most people really don't want to hear it? They're like, mm -hmm, bye. <laughs> I ain't got time for that. I got enough. I got enough. Nobody wants to be in that. And you don't want to stay in it. So it's when you find yourself is to stop. Now, I'm not saying that then you become Pollyanna, Pollyanna should say, never mind. The oh, world's all good. Mm -mm, that don't work either. It's you find yourself like really, really frustrated. You stop a minute and you switch it. And you're like, wait a minute. What's going on? How do I feel? Well, I'm feeling sad because I don't connect. I'm feeling so angry because our political system has gone haywire and has become normalized. I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this. And this is my prayer. This is my hope. Now, can you feel the difference in energy? So if you begin to catch yourself and break out of that, so you switch yourself back and forth. Now, my partner chooses to snap herself instead of switch them. I, I like the graceful kind route and just switch it. <laughs> <laughs> but don't snap, don't snap other people, whatever you do. <laughs> we'll have to have another one next month if that happens. Don't go, don't go there. So is your God out of the box? Is your God actively present wherever you are? There's a wonderful teacher. Would you show us this slide? Her name is Susan Ariel Rainbow Kennedy. Whatever has hindered us from consciously and confidently standing in the presence of God as the presence of God has been removed. And so we ask, is my God out of the box? Is my God actively present wherever I am? There is nowhere that God is not. And then finally, is your God in every face you see? And is your God in every form of creation you see? Can you see God in the bee? 
and in the grass. You see God in the tree and in the clouds. Is your God, is that one spirit, can we see it? When the veil was rent in two, completely torn in two, the people were no longer standing different distances. Everybody had equal access to that presence of God, the Holy Spirit. Every person in that very moment became a divine heir or son or daughter, so to speak, of the creative presence, which has been what Jesus' message was about. That's why the veil being torn was so uh, poignant, because it epitomized what his whole life was about. Because what his life was about was, I am the Son of God, and you are too. The things that I do, you can do, and even greater, he said. That we all have direct access. And if you've looked at me, you see the Father. If you're kind to a child, you're kind to your God. It's all one and the same. There's one more slide I want to show you of a man. His name is Lawrence Anthony in South Africa. Lawrence was a South African um, uh, conservative conservationist, I have to say, environmentalist, explorer, and best-selling author. He moved, uh, brought his wife from France to South Africa, bought a farmhouse, a huge reserve, where they began to care for all sorts of animals. When the Baghdad War happened, he was the man that actually escaped into, everybody else was trying to get out of Baghdad, he escaped into it to get to the zoo and to free the animals and to help save them. He's that kind of an activist. When he and his wife bought their property in Zululand in Africa, there were a whole um, herd of elephants they were getting ready to put down because the elephants had become uh, adversarial and they were trampling places and going places they shouldn't go. And he said it was on his heart so heavy that he actually packed some bags and told his wife he'd be back. He didn't know when, but he went out to live with the elephants. And so for a number of weeks, he stayed with them. He began to talk to them, commune with them, and over a period of time, people called him the elephant whisperer, because what happened is the elephants calmed down, they would stay in an area where they were supposed to stay, and everything seemed to be going fine. The elephants would make a trip, it usually took them about a day and a half to get from where they were. They would make a trip to Lawrence's house occasionally, and just visit him and go back. Well, suddenly Lawrence died. Everyone was devastated. It was totally unexpected. But what his wife wrote, she said, two days after Lawrence's death, it was a Sunday, I was still holed up in our bedroom. People passed in and out of the house, paying their respects, and it made no difference to me. And then one of our farm workers yelled, they're here, they're here. She says, who's here? They are here, and I knew what they meant. I dragged myself downstairs and I opened the front door. The staff were gathered outside, all staring in the same direction as the elephants formed a procession and came up to pay their respects to a man who had died. They came up to the house and they stayed at the fence and they made the same noise that they would make when they talked to Lawrence. They stayed for almost two hours and then they made a procession back. She goes on to write, but what made it so remarkable is that next year, exactly one year later, on March 4th, they came again. And if you think that wasn't enough, the next year and the next year, they came again on March 4th to have a procession. She wrote, how did they know? Who sent them? What does it mean? Some things in this world are beyond human understanding. It can't be explained by reason. She said, but what my husband taught me and what those elephants have taught me is that it can be experienced by the heart. When we recognize the common spirit, there's something else that gets opened up that we together enter into. That, my friends, is communion. When we recognize the sacred heart, a space opens that we enter into together, and that is communion. Sarah, would you give me that song? I want to close with this. I invite you to close your eyes. 
whatever has hindered us from consciously and confidently standing in the presence of God and as the presence of God, it has been removed. The Spirit of God is alive and well, breathing, animating, transforming, resurrecting again and again and again. That living spirit is the one spirit in you and me and tree and bee. It's not limited to our body. And it's not confined in any bounds or boundaries that we may create. For it is formless and boundless. It is the living spirit. And it is that spirit which was demonstrated through the life and the teaching of Jesus. And the greatest thing he pointed us to was to do this for yourself. Follow me. Follow in this way. Because what I'm doing, you're here to do and even greater. The living spirit is present within you. It is every fiber of your being like a ray of sun. And it is there sourcing you like the sun. And so where in my life am I forgetting to bring God to the party? Am I forgetting to bring my God consciousness, my higher awareness? Where can I lovingly and gently say, yeah, I... I need to make more room here for that. And to remember that there are no exceptions wherever I am. If my heart is beating and my breath is breathing, then the activity of God is present. The power that can heal and transform and help me bring things into manifestation is active and alive and well. And perhaps the greatest way that I can begin to, to more fully recognize and interact with the Spirit as a part of my everyday being is to consciously behold it in every face I see. I may be looking at their lampshade, but I know that the light, the Spirit, is the one Spirit to walk more reverently on this earth, to see my kinship with all of creation, to be the very presence of love that I am created to be. Some days I want a God who is smaller than sand Who sticks to my lashes Who lives in the cracks of my hands And isn't a runner He won't go away He'll never abandon me He'll always stay Sometimes the best God that I can portray is a small God, a small God. Someday I want a God who is lighter than air to teach me surrender. How to float on the edge of a prayer. Knows how to dance, he knows how to sway, he changes direction, he isn't afraid. Sometimes the best God that I can create is a light God, a light God. But today,
Separate you from me. To separate you from me. Some days I want a God who is softer than rain to tell me she loves me. That everything will be okay. We'll sit in the garden under the trees. She'll hold me with arms I can feel but not see. Sometimes the best God that I can conceive is a soft God, a soft God. But today, separate you from me to separate you from me today I need a God who is bigger than mountains today 